Hey, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Becoming Podcast from New Life Church. We're so excited to share in this conversation with you today as we explore what it means to become more people, more like Jesus. Happy listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Becoming Podcast. Hi, Pastor Michael. <laughs> hey, yes, how are you? I don't know if you usually call me Pastor Michael, but we, we sure. So my Bible studies teacher said I should call you Pastor Michael because when I call you Pastor before your name, it draws out more of your pastor gifts. And we need that today. Sure. Um, I'm not quite sure where I stand on that, but you're welcome <laughs> to just call me Michael. Okay. Um, and, and stoked that you have a Bible studies teacher who is uh, adept at honouring and that kind of thing. Hey, real quick, um, this cup of tea that you made us so lovingly, yes. what kind of milk did you put in it? Oh, you noticed it wasn't full cream? No, because it's not milk, is it? It's oat milk. So there's no such thing. There's, it's oat milk. Friends, if you have joined us on the Becoming podcast today, we'd just love to highlight we only believe in full cream milk and everything there else is a form of juice. We do not discriminate dairy-free and lactose intolerant. Guys, you are all welcome here. Well, until as you become more like Jesus and your taste refines. Yeah. Speaking of becoming more like Jesus today, Jess, we've got someone phenomenal on the podcast. I'm so excited. Bethany Allen. Bethany Allen, yeah. From Portland, America. Yeah, one of our favourite churches, Bridgetown Church. Yeah. Um, used Huge. to be led by a guy named uh, J- oh. John Mark Como. He's read a, read a bunch of great books. Biggest fan, number one fan. And then it's now run by a guy named um, Tyler. It's, it's really a team-based church, though. It it's, is. Um, it's phenomenal. Team. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you haven't yet listened to their podcast, I encourage you to go over. Their Bible teachings is awesome. Mm. What are you excited about? interviewing Bethany with today, Jess? Well, I'm just like so inspired by someone who is a woman in leadership and how she is so devoted. So she's the pastor of spiritual formation um, and leadership. Mm. And I think that's so amazing, like that she's has that role and she really carries it well within Bridgetown. Like they, that's something that's really important in their church. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes people come into church and they just stay a little, like they sort of plateau and they don't think that they have more spiritual formation to go. Yeah. Like they think they're happy in their faith and they don't need to continue forming themselves and yeah. stepping closer into God. So, yeah, I, I just can't wait to hear what she has to say about that stuff. And, and what is it about, you know, yourself being someone new to the faith in the mm. last couple of years? What, what is it that you're hoping someone in your f- stage of faith might learn today or might gain from today's conversation? Mm, I, yeah, it's such a great question. I think where to start is a really great one. Yeah. Because it was really confusing for me because I'm like, what do I do? Like, where do I... Like, I'm interested in God um, and I'm curious, but how do I know Him? How do I get to know Him? How do I strengthen that relationship with Him? Yeah, great. Um, and also, for me, it was like a coin flip. Mm. It was like a, I'm a believer and then now I'm not. And then now I'm going to be completely sinless. I'm going to be completely holy. The other way around. I'm not a believer and now I am. Yes. Sorry. Yes, great. What did I say? <laughs> you said, I'm a believer and now I'm not. I'm like, when did that one happen? <laughs> <laughs> just now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just thought like, oh, okay, now that I'm a believer, I'm going to be like sinless. I'm going to be this holy Angel, which I know that you think that I am. Uh, 100%. <laughs> but it's, no, it's not like that. It's not a no, switch. it's not at all. Yeah. It's a journey. So I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about that as well. Yeah. And then how about you, especially that I mean, you've been in faith for a while? Yeah, I mean, I've been in faith for a while. But I think for me, I would just agree. I think I get really excited um, as a male. Mm. Um, who really believes women need to be leading in the church. Totally. When you see uh, a, a female leader that is so strong in her preaching and teaching gifts, yeah. um, is someone that I listen to her sermons and, and God God shapes and forms me She's under her so teaching. So um, someone who I'd happily you know, follow as a pastor in a church I would attend. Like yeah. It's just, I, I love to celebrate that. Mm. Um, and I'm not, not because I'm, I'm trying to make this big deal out of it, but in our culture, it's just so rare. Mm. for us to celebrate this well. And so when we do see, I want to I want to highlight it. Then secondly, formation for me is the heart of new life. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. 
listeners may not be aware yet, but this is the Becoming podcast. Yeah. And this whole point of this podcast was around what does it mean for us to become more like Jesus? Mm-hmm. And that's the heart of the church that you and I attend. Yeah. Um, we wanna know what that means. And that question is a formation question. Yeah. What does it mean for us to become more like Christ? So yeah. I'm looking forward to a conversation so today. We should, we should head there now. Okay. We'll be back later. See you soon. See ya. Well, Bethany, it's great to have you with us today, hailing all the way from Portland in America. Um, it's great to have you on the Becoming podcast. And this, the podcast is all about becoming more like Jesus and what that looks like. Um, but to kick off Bethany today, I'd love to hear a little bit about you. Tell us a bit about who Beth is and, uh, and where you're from and the community you're surrounded with. Yeah, oh, it's so good to be with you guys. Honestly, such a privilege and an honour. Um, I am, like you said, in Portland, Oregon, where the sun doesn't shine. Um, <laughs> that's how it is this afternoon, a nice cloudy afternoon here in Portland. Um, I'm at Bridgetown Church, and currently I'm serving as the pastor of spiritual formation and leadership development. I've been here about uh, 12 years, and yeah, it's just been a gift to serve in this community. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. And I mean, we, uh, we've done a lot of stuff with Bridgetown in the past. We've been blessed by your ministry, um, not only by John Mark Comer in the past, but by Tyler now and a lot of the resources and uh, things that you guys are putting out. So really appreciate your time here. Now, your, your role is to oversee formation. Um, but what, what, what does that mean? What, what does that look like in the local church? Yeah, I mean, I think we used to use the old word discipleship when we talked about formation, I think in the last... 10 years or so, we've been dreaming up about, you know, really dreaming up what it means now and how we put this into practice. Mm. I think for us, one of the, you know, one of the definitions I love to use when it comes to formation, it's really been a grid for us at Bridgetown, um, comes from uh, uh, Dr. Robert Mulholland, who says, formation is a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. So that's how we would define formation is just what does it mean to actually be formed into the image of Jesus for the sake of other people or for the world. And obviously that breaks down and translates a lot of different ways. Um, But that's our overarching concept that we're going, okay, we're holding this out as the objective. Now, how then now shall we live in light of that? And what do we need to put into practice to become like Jesus? Yeah. I love that line, how, how then now shall we live? Um, it's been, uh, I don't know if you've read the, uh, like Francis Schaeffer's stuff on that or, or Charles Colson's stuff, but that stuff like deeply impacted yes. my own formation. Uh, part, of, part of what we do with the podcast, Bethany, is, is uh, we, we want this to be a resource for new Christians, but also mature Christians who may have uh, missed a step in their own journey and their own discipleship. One of the things in my own uh, formation and, and construction formation has also been thinking through, God, how did you form me? Mm. Were there any moments in your life that you look back now and you're like, oh, this was really critical for my formation, for who I was to become in, in, in and like Jesus, as other people are thinking through their own? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'd love to say it was some glamorous Holy Spirit encounter <laughs> where most of that has happened. But the truth is, when I think about that question, the answer is, I think I've been most formed by Jesus through my bro- most broken moments or the moments where I've had the most suffering or experienced the most pain. And, you know, in my life uh, at 14, my mom left our family um, it was a massively traumatic event. I didn't have contact with her for seven years, really formative years. And I think for me, that was one of those catalytic moments where I remember that everything people had said about Jesus, including my parents, what they had told me about him, um, either was going to be true or not true. And the way I would experience it was by inviting Jesus in and saying, in so many words, um, prove yourself. Are you really able to comfort me? Are you really able to give hope? Are you really able to be who I, who they've said you are? And for me, that was one of the first moments where I experienced God in a way that was transformative and true. Um, And then that's just continued throughout my life through really painful moments of losing loved ones and, you know, uh, falling out of relationship with other people. It's just been this consistent journey of experiencing Jesus Um, for who he says he is, um, 
over and over again in my brokenness, in my weakness, in my failure, in my desperation. So I'd love to point all of that to these like grandiose moments. And there have been very sweet moments, but where I've encountered the most uh, transformation and, and the most, I think, authentic relationship with Jesus is in those harder broken spaces. It's an interesting. You, I mean, you know, we we sent you these questions before the podcast, uh, Bethany, and I'm already off track. But if you come with me down the rabbit hole for a second. <laughs> the best way. Yeah, you know, one of one of the things you raise then is something, something close to my heart. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm someone that loves to learn. I love information. I feel like with more I can get more information, the quicker I can make decisions around what needs to happen. But the more I yeah. do formation, the more I realize information is only so helpful. Uh, you use this term there, like I needed to experience Jesus for who he yeah. really is. What, what yeah. role does encounter and experience play in comparison to just understanding about Jesus in the Bible? Like well, what's, what's the weighting you place on each of those things? So knowing about Jesus and experiencing Jesus, how do, you, how do those two factors uh, play out in the formation? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it, answer it perfectly, but, um, you know, I think, I think that we learn about Jesus, or at least this has been our experience. We learn about him so that we can encounter him. Mm. So when you talk about putting weights on both in the realm of spiritual formation, which that term can be scary in and of itself, like it's kind of an intense term where it's really about us relating to and knowing Jesus and being known by him and allowing that to be um, the pathway for who we become. So um, I think I'd hold both up. It's important to know about him. Like it's important to know about somebody you're going on a date with. It's important to have context and information to know a story and to know how that story actually reiterates who this person is going to be through the encounter and experience I have with them. And that's kind of the way that, you know, I look at it is like both are both are actually tethered to one another. If we're actually talking about formation that leads to transformation, you can be informed about something, but you cannot just be in, you can't be transformed through information, which I'm sure you've said a thousand times. And uh, to me, when we think about formation or when I think about it, even in my own life, the two have to be tethered or I'm out on the first one. Um, I want to know that what I'm reading and experiencing and learning about this person, this God is actually something I can experience and allow that to change my reality. Um, And that's, I think, the power of Jesus is that he can he did both. He engendered both of those realities they came to the earth and um, that's been compelling (laughs) in this arena, you know? No, I appreciate that. Um, And I I think for me, uh, the whole, what you said earlier about formation is the process of becoming like Jesus. One of the things about this podcast is it's, it's the becoming podcast. Uh, we we want to answer this question. I'm sure you've said this. Many people say it, but more, more uh, important than what you're going to do with your life is who are you going to become? Uh, yeah. it's, this, it's this central understanding that drives us. Why, why do you think formation, now outside of Bridgetown maybe, but formation for the majority feels at times for Christians, particularly in the West, has taken a back seat. Uh, it's, it's not an active question for a lot of uh, churches or Christians today. It's starting to make a bit of a resurgence mm-hmm. and what you guys have done with, you know, James C with Practicing the Way and all that stuff's been great, but th- th- that's yeah. only really just now starting to, to come through across the church. Why is formation so difficult, uh, lack of a better term, so unsexy for, for Christians to like wrestle mm-hmm. with well? Uh, why are we so reluctant to talk about formation? I mean, I think it's a great question. Again, I think, you know, I think for so many of us and so much of, I think the way that formation has been presented is very information heavy and less in encounter and transformation um, heavy. And I think that we are human beings who want to relate, want to experience love, want to experience reciprocity in relationship. We are people who want to experience encounter and so I think in the, you know, the ways it's been presented in the past has been hyper intellectual with this disconnect from it actually being integrated into everyday life, yeah. which means that it's even found itself in like a pious mentality of like, 
there's some separation or differentiation between those who are practicing these things and those who are actually living in the gritty realities of life. Mm. So I think we've done a disservice in the last, you know, 50 years, really, uh, in the in the church, if not more, in presenting a narrative that I think is divorced from its actual intent. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been the case. And I, I think, um, I also think if I can just speak frankly, I think it's easy. I think we all have this propensity to want to be able to control our own um, worlds. And entering into actual formation begins with surrender and submission to someone, Jesus, who you can't control. And so I think we've we've had, at least I've experienced it and do experience it in my own life, this resistance to formation because the invitation of these practices or this formation (laughs) confronts within me mm. this desire to be in control of even my own spiritual life of what's being asked of me or what's not being asked of me. So I think at a subconscious level, maybe a conscious level for many of us, there's also been a resistance over the last, you know, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it's been, because there's a cost that, um, that I think many of us don't want to name, but is there. And so if we can control a formula of information, it's safer than controlling the outcome of that. Yeah, you know wow. what I mean? Or So I think there's just something for us to consider. I have to consider it in my own life because I'm up against it a lot when I want to resist formation, you know, and conform to what I actually want. Yeah. So I think there's something there that we're not naming necessarily. It's, I mean, to your point where there's just been, I don't know, a reticence around it. Yeah. And I think it's because we're humans with our own propensities, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. And, um, you know, Bethany, you live in one of the, one of the most progressive cities in America. Um, some would yeah. say the world, but who knows? Let's, we don't need to go down there. And, and I, you'd probably feel this more prolifically than most, but I think the West is feeling it increasingly this pressure from secular culture and our context. And without going into like this culture wars thing of like, you know, condemning what isn't godly and whatever, what are, what are the what are the pressures or even the idols of our world that seek to disrupt our formation? Or what are the things that if we're not aware of them, they will disrupt our becoming like Jesus? Yeah. So um Another Man. question that we didn't prepare you for. So just, you know. Yeah, no, no, it's good. It's good. I mean, the first thing that kind of uh, comes to my mind is um, the idol of self-comfort. I mean, especially uh-huh. those of us in the West, right? I mean, everything is about our pleasure, wow. our comfort. How do we insulate ourselves from even the other? You know, how do we keep ourselves at, an, at enough of a distance where I don't actually have to, it's not costly to me um, to do A, B, C, or D, whatever it looks like. And so I think, you know, I mean, I know at the heart of all idolatry is self-worship, is the worship of another, you know. And I think for so much of us, our comfort is one of the greatest obstacles in actually being um, and, and actually entering into um worship of the rightful God. I think, you know, in Portland, especially the word I think we use often around here is hedonism Mm -hmm. (laughs) in like an old school kind of way where we are a city marked by pleasure. It's about sexual pleasure. It's about like food pleasure, our consumption of goods. It's visual pleasure. It's all the things that sensually we want and want to have satisfied in our, at least this cultural space uh, that we're in says, gratify everything that you want um, and keep, give yourself, create for yourself the most joy you possibly can. Yeah. Um, wow. And I think that's what we're, I think that's primarily what we're up against. That's what we're worshiping. And ironically, um, you know, and I think a lot of people would say this, you see so much slavery in that, yeah. you know, there is a desperation within the worship of that idol because it's never enough because it never satiates. And so, It just seems to be this cycle that, you know, we're up against. But that comfort, that self-pleasure, satisfaction, age old, but real. And for us, um, I think more and more we're having to go like, this isn't working. Play this all the way out and let's see if this works. And if it doesn't, then what? What do you do? You know, so... 
How, how yeah. do you um, how do you play through that as a pastor in a church, teaching your people to interpret culture without always condemning culture? Like, is is it wrong for us to consume good food? And you would say no. Like, um, that's an easy question. It's not wrong for us to yeah. be entertained by good entertainment. It's not wrong for us sure. to listen to music that's not overtly Christian. You know, like I remember in the nineties. I don't know. I mean, I was very young, but I remember the whole thing, like, you know, burn your CDs if, if they're, oh, yeah. you, know, you know, someone's praying for against God over that CD and that kind of thing. <laughs> so how do you know the yeah. things you're talking about around self-comfort, but still encourage mm. people to find good in the world around them and not condemn it, but be maybe critiquing of it? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it all comes back to helping people see who gave you the gift? Mm. <laughs> you know, I think I think we're just the the conversation isn't. I mean, obviously, God created all of these things that are good. Any mm. goodness, I think, is connected back to Him. So, I think in the church, the work that we're doing is trying to say, like, yeah, this is good, and it it can live in its own goodness without dominating you or consuming you if you connect the gift to the giver. Mm. Like if you actually say this is connected to not just someone who gave this to me, but to the nature of someone who is perfectly good and able to satisfy and satiate. And this points to a greater story and person. Yeah. And I think for us, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think, you know, I grew up in the 2000s, like early, I was burning my CDs or throwing them into coffins and doing all kinds of weird things. Um, in that early church culture, to my shame Nailing and detriment, to a, cross. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. I mean, there's got to be a lot of things for me. Everyone did and it was, on the youth camp, right? Yeah, we. I mean, totally. So we were doing that. But, you know, I think one of the things that we are trying to do is to say, like, there is beauty in our culture. We're not trying to be weirdos. You know, I mean, we live here. This is the city we've chosen to live in or the place God has invited us to be. And But how do we reframe it in a way that isn't ignorant of what actually is happening, but actually calls us to see where God is at work and the realities of his kingdom are yeah. at play? And I think we're just asked, you know, that's the framework we're trying to give to our community um, as they're trying to figure out what it means to be like Jesus, to do what he would do in real time. And he wouldn't avoid the culture. He would be an, a part of it and he would be helping create it. And so... Yeah. I think that's kind of the vision we're trying to hold to, never perfectly working that out, but actively pursuing that, you know. Uh, I think that word you just said, that word create, that's brilliant. I can't remember who it was, but I was listening to a sermon recently about someone said there's, there's a couple different ways we can interact with culture. Um, we can condemn it. We can copy it. Um, I think there's a third, but then he said the last way is the way of Christ. It's actually to create culture. Um, don't copy oh, the world's good. culture. Don't. Don't condemn the world's culture. Create a new culture. And um, yeah. it's so refreshing growing up, as I'm sure you did as well, um, in a time where it was like either, you know, we we take the best from culture and just imitate it or we, you know, condemn it and run from it. Just, just think about, oh, man, where are the artisans? Where are the people who have music ability or, you know, political ability can actually begin to create some, some ways in the kingdom of God? Um, and, yeah. and Bethany, you know, as I hear you talking, to, to draw us to the reason for our podcast, there's someone listening today that's a new Christian and they're, they're loving everything you're saying, but the question in their mind is, where does my formation start? Like, what, 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 what do I do now? What, what, are the, what are the steps that you would say someone's recently decided to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior, apprentice unto him? What would be your advice to them about the journey ahead or even where to begin that journey? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Also, not sure that's on the list. No. So let's see what we come up with. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Uh, Jess, our producer, is going to have a long conversation with me after this one. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, you know, I think I think that, um, and I think we think this that um, formation starts with communion with God. Oh, great. Is like how we'd say it. So I think that it starts with. And, and, and I think this word just gets so, again, I think if I was coming into the church nowadays, I think I'd be intimidated by it. But like it starts through prayer. It starts through relating to God oh, yeah. and with God. And the good news is it can 
be like any other conversation you have with people. And I think that's what I would say is like the first thing you figure out is just how you talk to God, how you begin to relate to God as a person. And most people who are new to the journey have some constructs or some experience of God. And in, I think that's the helpful invitation is like, that's the place to start is start with what you do have. Start with the invitation that was extended to you. Start with the experience you had and and begin to connect with God. So I would say it starts with that communion, that prayer with God. And then I think, you know, one of the next steps is to make sure you're in a community where God can be reflected to you and where you can hear his voice through other people and just begin to incubate mm. in that space. You know, I think we could get into the disciplines. So obviously I think reading the Bible is helpful, knowing what God sounds like, knowing yeah. stories about yeah. his life, all of those things. But I think if I was just starting, I would say, learn, you know, start with talking to communing with God, being with God and being with God's people. And those two things I think are a good on ramp to beginning the journey of, of becoming like him. You know, I think about people often are like, well, it's not working. You know, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm being formed with that, which I'm like, welcome to the journey. That's yeah. how it feels a lot of the time. Um, but I think so much of it is, is like starting a new relationship with anybody. Yeah. It's like, I'm just learning. It's okay to say that in the Christian faith or on the journey, we have to do that with God too. We just have to get to know him and allow ourselves to be known by him. And that takes time and it takes being together to kind of know what that's like. Yeah. And I really think sometimes we overthink that. I think, and get ourselves freaked out by it. But I think it's as simple as being with him and being with his people. Man, communing with God and with others. I, Bethany, I don't think we should have sent you any question because you're, the, the way you're handling them all is brilliant. <laughs> um, but, but one thing I did want to talk about today is in the process of formation, people will open the Word of God and they start to come across different passages or historic teachings of the church that can be troubling. Um, and one of those would be women's... Women's, yeah, you're like, where's he going right now with this one? This is, this is going to be crazy. <laughs> no, um, it would, would be the, the women's role in the church and in leadership. Yeah. Um, some caveats. Uh, I've, I've listened to you preach on the Bridgetown podcast. I've been deeply blessed um, and thankful for the, God, the gift God has given you. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and so I ask this as someone that I would deeply affirm has a strong teaching and preaching gift, um, someone who I would love to have come teach and preach at New Life one day. Uh, but... I think we sometimes, I sometimes ask some people about this and the secular world go, why is the church still asking questions about women in leadership? And which is fair, yeah. but then people in the church would say, because there's some really problematic texts in the Bible yeah. that's, that's not, not overtly clear to us. So how have you come to a place where you believe women leading and teaching is something to celebrate not, not to be yeah. questioned. Um, and how do we wrestle with some of these texts well? I mean, let, we don't have to go into expository preaching of, of them all. I'm happy to just do brushstrokes yeah. today. Great. I love that. Let's do brushstrokes because those are <laughs> more intense passages. And I think uh, I love this question. Like I know it's a challenging one, but I love it because it's something I wish someone would have said to me or I would have heard someone say. So I'll just say the main thing, the main reason I think it's easy and should be easy for anyone to affirm um, a woman walking in her gifting in the community of faith or in the community of Jesus. And that, I think, goes back to Genesis chapter one. I think it goes back to God, which I don't think we teach very often um, as robustly as we could, but of God affirming his image in both men and women. And the fullness of God's image isn't seen until both are together. Mm. So if I just have one image, um, I'm only missing, I'm missing part of God's actual reflection. So when it comes to this bigger conversation of like, where do women fit? What about some of these problematic texts? I start with Genesis and go, hold on a second. This is, this is the beginning. So I want to start with how God created um, and what he was doing when he created. And he was telling a story about the flourishing of the world. And that is that men and women are partnering together and expressing who he is in the purest form of who he is together. So when we look at 
texts like Paul's text, who would have been well studied in the Hebrew, would have known these stories, would have known a narrative um, rooted in these ancient scriptures. I, for me, have looked at them and re-looked at them in this last season. Our church is doing a deeper dive into some of these texts again, revisiting them again. Um, looked at it through that lens, through the narrative arc of the scriptures, where it starts and where it ends. It starts with men and women fully stewarding the kingdom of God, and it ends with men and women at a banquet feast together participating in the kingdom of God. Mm. And that's kind of the grid through which I hold everything. Now, when you look at Paul's text and you listen to certain um, scholars around each of those, there's going to be different ways that they read and interpret the text based on their scholarship and based on the system that they exist in. So, you know, I think it's fair to say, like, we've had to read from many different camps around these texts and discern biblically and wisely. And that's a whole other podcast for another day and for somebody more brilliant to do than myself. But I think, and I think there's a good wrestle, but I think what I would want people to hear is that, um, you know, what we see in Paul, even some of these troubling passages um, are not one dimensional and they are connected to an actual story that the scriptures tell and a story that Paul told with his life as he commissioned women to serve and partner with him. Yeah. in the early church. So I think I just hold on to those truths. And I think too, you know, I think in our church, one of the priorities that we have kept, especially as we've, especially I've had a journey here as being a woman in ministry, it's been a progression for us. But I think um, one of the things we've just kept in front of us is there has to be the image of God or the Imago Dei represented in everything we do. So when I preach the scriptures, I'm preaching it as an expression of God's presence and voice in our community. Just like when Tyler preaches, he's preaching it that way, but both are needed to hear the the full breadth of who God is and what he's trying to say to our community. Mm. So I don't know if that answers your question. Honestly, it it feels boring, but I just, I think I'd want to affirm to those listening. You can't argue with that. You cannot argue with the image of God. And I think far too often we haven't started with that. We've started with these other passages and then built around that. And I don't know that we do that with anything else in the scriptures, at least some of these major issues. So, yeah. um, no, I, I just affirm everything you've said. I mean, for me, the other, the other question I have is, you, Jesus talks a lot about fruit. He talks a lot about you'll know yes. a tree by its fruit, um, you know? And yes. um, I, I, I think two things, <laughs> just be controversial for a second. We might get some emails about this. And but number one, I think we 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 criticize a lot of uh, female communicators because they're like, oh, they didn't handle the word well. And one thing I'd say about that is, I don't think we actually create cultures that that empower and train women to preach as readily as we do men. And so, women that yeah. have come through and are communicating, um, we should be celebrating that they've actually gone against the cultural tide, not 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 yeah. being overly critical. The second thing is. There is actually quite a wealth of amazing women leaders in the world whose fruit is robust, like yourself, like people like Christine Kane, like Susie Silk in um, yes. Church of the City. We've got people even here at New Life, uh, like Fiona and Anna and Courtney and all these others who I, when I hear them preach, I'm like, oh, thank God that you aren't holding yes. back this, this gift because of gender, gender roles. Um, I, get, I get a bit angry about it. A lot of my friends sometimes are like, well, you know, they, they would agree and then they'd say, but the way that we see the fullness of the image of God is the male would teach and, and the female would teach two children. And, and mm. um, that, that gets me a bit frustrated um, because I think, I think y- 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 they're not recognising. So the children are being deprived from a male voice and then yeah. the adults are being deprived from a female voice. And, and what you're saying is that we all need to hear, for lack of a better word, the complementarity in its great way in every yes. area, in every area of the church. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which we saw in the early church too. And I think, you know, I think to your, your point, we have systems that have held to this view, whether they've said it or not, that has... Um, it's just failed to equip half the church to do the work of ministry. And I mean, even if you land in a more conservative camp, um, there is a responsibility in Matthew 28 to make disciples who are able to make disciples. And so I think some of my pushback would be, you know, 
are we doing that? And are the the systems that we've created, have they actually been able to um, be faithful to what we've been asked to do? And I think the answer would be no. I think you could, at least you could look across the U.S. at a, you know, seminary level and know that that's true. So I think, yeah, I love your passion for it. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, uh, I know it's a personal topic to many people. It is especially personal to women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I could be journey. as passionate as and, I want, but I don't have to suffer it. You know? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I mean that respect. I mean that like we're, I'm grateful for that, and no, I think I that. that that's the that's the. This has been a it's a, it's not been a journey that's just one dimensional. It's multi dimensional, and eager to be faithful to steward God's word. Um, but I think that has also meant that many of the women who are stewarding God's word have ha- done double the work of discerning rightfully if if this is an invitation from the spirit, because hopefully we fear God and fear. Um, yeah. Fear stewarding what he's entrusted to us. Well, so, I mean, hot topic for sure, but one that to me feels like uh, simple in many ways too. Yeah. So, well, you yeah. Know, maybe a bit of a lighter question then. Something interests me as a communicator myself um, yeah. Where, like, what was what were significant things in your journey that led you to uh, kind of develop your own gift of communication? You didn't wake up one day, open the Bible, and people like, oh, wow, Bethany should preach. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like what? Let's say someone's here sitting, going, oh man, I could never. I often find people say, I could never do what you do, Michael, about communication. And my answer is, is often, oh, you could. There, yeah. There's, <laughs> The question is, do you want to do what I've done to to yeah. to be able to communicate? Um, that's it's a difference. So, what what are the things that you've done or that have been that have been discipled in you that led you to be an effective communicator? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I was. This is unfair, but I'll just throw this in there. I was trained in theater for a long time. So that was really helpful. No, I think it is. Yeah. I'm a trained teacher. And I say to people, my, people don't know how much my teaching degree actually influences a lot of what I do. Yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah, so much. So that's like the undercurrent that not everyone has to do. But that was helpful. You know, I think for me, I remember... Um, uh, burning in me as a teenager to want to um, sound so dorky and nerdy, but like I loved the Bible. So even a youth group, I was like, oh, I want to be able to somehow learn about it. And then I want people to understand what I'm learning. And that was like kind of the driving force. So at 18, I started a Bible study because I was like, why not? And I'm sure it was horrific and I'm sure it was heretical in many ways. But um, I think that's where it started. Like I started to communicate because I burned to communicate. Like I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't contain what God was teaching me and I wanted to teach others. Wow. And I certainly didn't think that would mean preaching in my context growing up. That definitely did not mean preaching. So I just did Bible studies for a long time, um, wrote them, taught them, was terrible, I'm sure. And also could feel the presence of God. I think about Eric Liddell's line about feeling the presence of God when he runs I remember feeling God's presence when I taught in a way I didn't experience it in any other space. So um, I leaned into that. And then I thought, oh, I can, uh, in my context, um, I thought, I'll just teach women. And um, and so I just did that. And so I think I've just had a nature of creating my own opportunities (laughs) and churches just letting me be like, sure, you can do that Bible study or you can do this class or you can do whatever and I just did that for a while. And at Bridgetown, I started doing that um, with a class that I still teach called God and Women. And that eventually blew up because there's such there was a hunger. And then eventually that led into a bigger conversation with John Mark and the elders and um, just said, what do we think about women teaching? And I never thought it would be me. But, um, yeah, I got to spend some time with John Mark and study under him um, then got to co-teach with him a few times. And then it was like off to the races. He's like, you just got to jump into the pool at some point. So I did. <laughs> so that was kind of my journey. But I think, you know, it really did start uh, from me just, and I know it's bizarre, but nobody handed me an opportunity and said, I think you're gifted. Yeah, great. And I just thought I have to, if I'm burning to do this, then I need to be faithful to do it in the 
humble places, the hidden places. And I never thought I would be doing it in a public space. Um, but the Lord had other plans and I was ready when that time came because I was just doing what I had always done. Um, so the thespian in me and then the little determined Bible study girl in me was just going after it. Yeah, Bethany, and, I actually think that's probably some of the best advice and I would concur. You know, I think what I'm hearing from you and what I'd, I'd also emphasize is if you believe God's given you a gift to teach the Bible, do it wherever yeah. you can, as often as you can, no matter how yes. big it is. You know, uh, yes. I, I think people often think that learning to preach means that the church gives you the platform and then you preach. And it's like, ah, oh, no, nah, just, yes. just just, do it at home. Do it with the family. Do it with your small group. Do it, home, do it with your home group. If you get an opportunity to do any form of communication in any way, shape or form, just, just do it. Um, yes. and, and the gift gets crafted and developed over time. And there's a bunch of intentionality there too, but no, that's super helpful. And um, yeah. Beth, Bethany, we're, we're almost done with our time, but the one question I thought would be great is, at Bridgetown, you guys call them apprentices, not disciples. Yeah. Now, I know you're not against the term disciple. You're not you know, saying, well, Jesus got it wrong, so let's, let's <laughs> keep moving. Um, and I know some of it's about your hermeneutic and how you interpret the word as well. But why, yeah. why is it that there is a deep passion around we want to apprentice under Jesus, not just disciple under Jesus? A term I, the apprentice term I, I deeply love. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's born out of our desire to paint a picture that um, your relationship or journey with Jesus is lifelong. It's like a lifelong learning experience and it's relational. So, you know, I think sometimes we think about discipleship as more top down. You know, I'm teaching you. I'm whatever. And I think in the apprentice context, there's this um, rabbinic imagery that's basically like I'm relating. I'm living my life next to you. I'm learning from you. I'm listening to your words. I'm watching how you interact yeah. with the poor, how you interact with the grocery store clerk or whoever it is. And I am living life actively relationally with you over my entire lifetime. There's no, you know, there is an endpoint for an apprentice at some point. Um, but the idea is that you're being formed and always being formed. And I think that was part of the choice of that language was just, we wanted to say that none of us have arrived and we're all learning in and through relationship with, with God, how to become more like him. And, um, and it's a journey worth taking. You know, I think there's a good posture of humility in that because we're always learning and um, and hopefully that also promotes this hunger to want to always learn. So it's kind of there was no magical uh, story behind that, except that that's some imagery that we held as valuable and continue to hold as valuable. Uh, it's beautiful, Bethany. And it's the heart of what we do and why we do what we do. Uh, we are wanting to be a people who are becoming more like Jesus. And I think that idea of apprenticing, of Jesus teaching, of shaping, of guiding us, that's critical. So Bethany, I just want to say thank you so much for today. Um, yeah, I know in, the, in the, you know, the hurricane of ministry, rarely ever do you think, I wonder how people in Australia are receiving this today, you know. But no, <laughs> but know that that it is being received over here. I've, I've had staff text me this morning, be like, you're interviewing Bethany today. So um, uh, yeah, really appreciative of all you do um, and deeply thankful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving us your time today. Oh, I'm so honored, so grateful for your community. Grateful that I got a chance to be with you today. Seriously, such a gift. Well, thanks so much, Bethany. You're a blessing. We'll catch you soon. Well, we're, uh, we're back from the interview with wow. Bethany Allen and I, I had a great time today. She's amazing. Like yeah. I'm in love with her. Oh, that's very strong. That's <laughs> yeah, very that strong. very strong. Yeah. You deeply admire her. Yeah. I yeah, didn't know yeah. that she was single though. Yeah, well, I don't know if she mentioned that in the podcast, but she shared that with this with us. Okay. Um, yeah, so she might have. <laughs> My bad. No, that's Sorry. fine. Sorry, Bethany. Uh, but, you know, I, I actually think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. You know, here is a woman who is confident in who she is. Mm. She's, she's following the call of God in her life. Mm. Um, she, she mentioned to us when we were offline that that's, that's a hope she does have for that status to change, but she's not waiting on that to no. do what God's um, calling her to do. I, I mean, I found that encouraging. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. You like when, that part? Well, I feel like when you feel like you're loved by God, you don't like seek out 
outwardly feel that love. Like you just yeah. feel that love. And then anything extra is just like, yeah, just extra and a bonus. It's a blessing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, hey, moving back to the content that you did share with us today, Sorry, Jess. Guys, yes. what, what, what's some standouts for you? Like, what, what's something that um, impacted you today? I love that you guys talked about how we can be shaped and formed, will be influenced by the world. Mm. And I'm a big believer on you are what you consume. Mm. So that goes with what you watch, what you read, what mm. you hear. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to be disciplined in your spiritual formation when outside, like, you know, the music you listen to, like things on social media, what you watch can really influence you on how you think and what, what you believe subconsciously too. Like you, you're like, oh, that's silly, but that's something that you might carry. Mm. Um, and I like that she was talking about how I mean, even you mentioned, like, it's, we shouldn't condemn the world, but we should just be super aware of it. Mm. Um, and I guess it's more of an invitation to really step deeper into faith yeah. when you are surrounded by those things. Yeah, no, I love that too. What do you I, think? Well, you know, for me, I, I probably really appreciated the way that, there's this great saying, says you can't fake history with God. Yeah. You know, you can't fake long form relationship with God and, no. and in the way she talks, the way she expresses stuff, you just hear she's done the journey. Mm. She's walked the walk and, and, and she's not someone who's just found this easy, mm. but she's allowed God to do something in her and now mm. she wants to see it done in others. And I thought that was so beautiful. And how about what she said about you develop a deeper relationship in your faith and with God through your suffering. Yeah. That really touched me. Mm. And it made me think, oh, perhaps the people that suffer, the, well, I don't know, the more suffering you go, you experience, sorry, the more opportunity you have to step further into faith. And uh, it might yeah. even be a gift and it might not feel that at the time. And that's a really strong statement. Suffering could be a gift, but I, how many times in hindsight are you like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I went through that because it's for me as a person. Well, the Bible emphasizes that, Jess. In, in, John, in James chapter one, it says, be, be uh, considerate joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials and tribulations of many mm. kinds. Yeah. The thing about it, consider it joy. Yeah. Why? Because in Romans, it also goes on to say, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Yeah. Suffering, suffering for me is a reminder that I'm not made for this world. There's mm. a new world that I'm made for. Yeah. But in this world, whilst there's hardship and God's doing something in us. Yeah. So I think it's a powerful thought. You, um, I mean, you're one of the reasons why we do this podcast, Jess, is because we want to really resource people who are walking in their journey with Christ. Were there any further questions you had from today you want to finish discussing briefly before we wrap up? Well, I wanted to ask, uh, during the transition of spiritual formation, so when... Um, when you're a non-believer, then you transition to a new believer and you're learning about the Bible and how God really wants us to live. Mm. How do you deal and wrestle with that feelings of guilt and like shame or, you know, those feelings while you transition? Because mm. it's not just like a, like I said bef before your conversation with Bethany, it's not like a switch. It's, it is a journey. So how do you wrestle with like, leaving the old mm. and stepping into a new identity. And that's not to say I don't feel joy and peace. I, how I feel now is immeasurably so much better. But there are things that God has asked me to let go of and give up as I step into this new stage of my life with Him. And I've been obedient. But sometimes I'm just like, damn, that sucks. I didn't want to let go of that. <laughs> well, so there's two things you said there. There's one where like you carry shame yeah. and another one where you carry the desire to continue. <laughs> right? And they're two separate things. Sure. The first one with shame, I think, one of the things I would say is, I think there are two voices we can listen to about our darkness. Mm. The first voice is the voice of condemnation, which mm. says, this is who you are. Mm. And, and that's not the voice God brings. Yeah. And I think the voice of conviction is a voice that says, this is not who you are. Yeah. And, and, and celebrating that. So like when I think back through my darkness and the times that I've walked through that and the things I've done, mm. 
I, I want to give strength to the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, but Michael, that's not who you are. Mm. So, so, yeah, so, so that, those, those moments were not you being who I've called you to be, yeah. rather than like, you know more than this. Yeah. And so one of the things I'd say to you is learn to listen to what the Holy Spirit says, says about the shame. Mm. And it's a spiritual discipline. There are things that happened to me when I was a little kid that I just have to continue bringing before God. Yeah. And he reminds me, this is not who you are. Yeah. This is not who you are. With the desire thing, I think, I think we've got to, in another spiritual discipline, we've got to become so fascinated and hungry for the kingdom of God yeah. that our desires for the things of this world pale in comparison. Yeah. C.S. Lewis says it like this, we are like children who are playing in mud pits and making mud pies and mud castles, thinking it's the best thing in the world, yeah. failing to realise that we've been invited to a feast with the king. Yeah. And we, he said, the, the issue is not that our desires are too strong, mm. but our desires are not strong enough. They're mm. too easily satiated by the things of the world. Yeah. And I was like, those desires you have to continue doing those things. My question would be, what's at the root of them? And how might God be longing to fulfill them for you? Mm. Um, you know, so when I'm, when I'm flicking through Instagram because I'm worried or I'm anxious or like, you know, my mind can't settle, what, what's yeah. actually at the root of that? Yeah. It's what's peace. Happening? Yeah. I want peace. Yeah. I want distraction. I want to not feel worried and anxious anymore. Yeah. And they're things God actually says, Michael, I can, I'd love to provide that for you yeah. better than Instagram. Now, that's a lightweight version of all the things we're talking through. Yeah. But um, hey, I'm conscious of time today, so we might have to wrap up there, okay, Jess. But perfect. if people want to get more involved with the podcast, what should they do? Um, so go to church.nu slash becoming or make sure you like, subscribe or comment below on what other topics that you want to hear from. Yeah. On our podcast. Or who you'd like us to interview. Even yes. more importantly, share. Share this with your family, share this with your friends. We'd love that. Hey, Jess, I just feel maybe we should just finish with prayer today. Shall we do that? Yes. Let me pray. Gracious God, Lord, I thank you so much for Bethany today and the time mm. we're able to share with her. We thank you for the way that you've not only spoken through Bethany, but the way that you're speaking to and through us right now. Mm. I pray for those listening that today that they wouldn't have heard the voice of just us, but the voice of the Holy Spirit, mm. whispering words of affection, words of life, words of conviction and calling us ever further to become like your son, Jesus. We love you, God, and we need you more and more every day. Less of us, more of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you next time, guys. Thanks, bye. Thanks for listening. We hope we passed on some valuable knowledge on how you can become and lead a life more like Jesus. If this message inspired you, please make sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a single podcast or share it with a friend. And for more information and resources on what we discussed today, please visit church.nu slash becoming. See you next time and God bless.